I want to just read a passage of scripture from me to you. This is my thoughts, exactly the same thought that the Apostle Paul had in the, God, in the book of Philippians, which is actually a letter you find in the New Testament. If you're looking for it, it's after the Corinthian letters. You probably see them right away. It's before Hebrews, which is kind of big. So if you're trying to locate it, that's where you're going. It's a letter from a pastor to a church, and this is really, really how I feel. I am being so inspired by your faith. Every time I, I, I pray, I find myself thanking God for you and learning from you. There's just this really neat moment and season in the history of the church and in what God's doing larger than New Hope, his capital C church right now. I'm just being inspired by it. And so let me just start this time of my sharing with you just by totally plagiarizing the Apostle Paul's words, stealing them, putting them in my mouth, and you, you right now are Philippians. This is the city of Philippi. You are the earliest Christians. Please hear these words. Philippians chapter 1, verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Every time I remember you, I thank God. Every time I'm with him, talking to him, I'm thanking him for you, always. In every prayer of mine, for you all, making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you and you and you and you and you and you and me in us, he will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart for you are all partakers with me. Partakers, like communion, right? Partakers with me of grace. And now he talks about his circumstance in his, both in his imprisonment and in the defense and the confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness how I yearn for you with all the affection of Christ Jesus. And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more, your sacrificial, agape, servant kind of love, that it may abound more and more with knowledge and all discernment, so that you may approve, you might figure out and know, you may, be, may approve what is excellent, and so be pure and blameless, for the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God. It is right for me to feel that way about you because I see your faith thriving, growing, building, expanding. And we all share a common faith in Christ, but it looks different in each one of us comes filtered through our personalities, comes filtered through our, our backgrounds, comes filtered through our language and language barriers, comes filtered through our traditions, right? But we feel it when we feel it, and we know that we're the same, even though it looks different or comes out different or has a different flavor to it. And I love that. I love this church. You see, what Paul did there at the end, he didn't say, good job, you're all set, he said, I'm praying for you that there may be abundance of the kind of faith that I see and that it would actually be a faith that isn't just love blindly, but a faith that's got some knowledge and wisdom behind it, is a solid, rooted faith that's not going to just get thrown away. It's not going to wither. It's not going to be temporary. I want it to, to last, and I want it to be more because how exciting to have more of exciting. How joyful to have more of joy. How fruitful to have more fruit. And sometimes, so this is our caution, sometimes we get so excited about something that God gave us that we just hold it and stare at it and love it forever. And we never move on, not realizing that that's one of a million moments that God has for us. And we idolize that moment Instead of saying, drop in the bucket, great, next, where are we going, Jesus? Drop in the bucket, great, next, where are we going, Jesus? And just continuing that he who began a good work will complete it in you. Let me try to think. Oh, I know why this is so fresh in my mind. Um, our family, with some younger kids, was blessed 
to watch the enlightening, profound, and deeply moving Dora movie yesterday. You're going to get insight from Dora right here, so get ready, okay? We've got Paul first and then Dora, equal spiritual giants. <laughs> so Dora has this experience where she and her cousin are separated when they're very young and they reunite high school age, that kind of thing. And evidently when they split, they had a candy bar and they cut it in half and each gave half. And then they reunite and she's still very innocent and naive and she holds up this green moldy something and at first you don't even know what it is and she's like, do you have yours? And he's like, what is that? It's the candy bar that we split. I've been waiting to see you again so we could take your half and my half and mush them back together again or something. And she, he's like, I guess I probably ate mine about 10 years ago. And she's like, oh. So then she proceeds to eat hers, which I don't think is a good idea. Um, but there's unity and commitment there, so go family. But that's like what we're like. I remember this one time that I went on a mission trip and it was amazing and we saw people get healed and we saw people come to Christ and we didn't even have money to go on this trip and then checks arrived in the mail out of the blue and it was so good 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 and it was so good. But it was 10 years ago. Don't you think that God's got more candy bars for you in 10 year time span than the one we're hanging on to? I do. And so I love the joy that Paul has with also like a little push. You love it? Good. God's got more. You love it? Good. It's for his glory. He wants to keep working on you. And so that's my prayer. I can't be more excited about what I see in the faith of us right now. But I think maybe I've just been a part of church. I've been part of faith long enough to know that things like cycle and what one day we're excited about, the next day we can be bored by. I don't ever want to be bored by how God works in the world and how he can use us and what he might do. So don't hang on to your little candy bar. Don't be so excited about an L Street that's coming you know, next week that we think that L Street is like the pinnacle of our spiritual lives. It's a drop in the bucket and Jesus has more and I'm excited for us to get there. But I thought that on this Thanksgiving service, I would take four different groups within the church that are specifically inspiring me and that I would do what Paul has done. I would say thank you for what you're doing and this is what the Bible has to say to you. So we're going to talk about the older, the younger, the battlers, and the baby Christians. And all I want to do is just read a couple of scriptures to thank you for inspiring me with where you're at in your faith but to encourage you that God's got more to keep moving. So open to the book of Titus, the letter. Keep flipping forward in your Bibles. It is right before the book of Hebrews, so flip just a couple of books forward. We're going to read the letter of Paul to Titus, and we're going to be in chapter 2. So one particular group right now is just so inspiring me within our church are the older people of faith. So if we say that like 40 or 50 somewhere is middle age, I'm 43 in a month, so I'm somewhere in the middle there, then we're talking about the people that are 50 and older. Anyone above that, all right? Older, not old. Don't get sensitive on me here, all right? <laughs> And then we're going to talk about the younger, so maybe like teens and 20s and that group there. But if you fall into the older category, then I love you now more than I've ever loved you before because of what I see God doing in your life. There is a group of Christians that have walked together for a while, this kind of like older group in our church that are banding together and are teaching us all a lesson in what it looks like to be missional. They're teaching us all. And in a way, as we're trying to get missional communities started, they have an unfair advantage because they were already together as a group. But when Danny and I and all of us prayed and said, we're really feeling like God pushing us towards mission, the first thing they said was, that's a great idea. How could we take what we have and put it out? This is the group that meets weekly for digging into the Bible. And not just here in a church, but over in a senior center out in the world. This is a group that through the senior center meets people who need help moving boxes and getting cars fixed, and they meet those needs. This is a group that said, oh, there's an AA in our church that's meeting. What if we just put on a chili dinner for them once a month? And they're doing that. 
This is a group that I saw several members sitting down in our grand room just a week or two ago being kind of like advocates for a couple of seniors in town that are about to lose their home and needs assistance. And so three or four people from that group became like a brain trust and sat down and said, who can we call? And they're on the phone. I'm walking through. They're on the phone making calls to the state and the town and these agencies to try to help this older couple who isn't getting that help from their family. It's right that the older Christians would lead the way. That's the way scripture says it's supposed to happen. And so that's what I want to read. I want to commend you because you are starting. You are paving the way. And you are showing us what it can look like to invest in the world around you, to live missionally. So the letter to Titus here, chapter 2, um, is advice to Titus on, on how to like, encourage his conversation. He talks about older and younger. So let's just read it together. Paul says, but as for you, teach what accords with sound doctrine. So teach right, teach solid, teach scripture. Keep it pure, keep it grounded. Older men are to be sober-minded, like clear thinking, serious, intentional, think, think like that, sober-minded, dignified, to have dignity about them, something respectable, right? Older men, sound in their faith. Men who have lived longer in that faith, they should be solid in it by now. Teach them to be self-controlled, not impulsive, not reckless, but like within themselves, a solid source of faith to share with others, sound in their faith, but also sound in their love. So not grumpy old men, but like men who have gravitas and love, the ones who can smile with and play with children as well as have the deepest theological conversation with an adult, right? And in steadfastness, men that, who have stuck with their family, men who have stuck with their faith, men who have stuck with their job, men who have stuck with the Lord. Steadfastness, which is not easy for anybody. So if someone's made it a long time walking the road with the cross on their back, then you know they have something to offer because they've seen a lot, and yet they're still with God. That group of older men is inspiring me in this church, but it doesn't stop there. Verse 3 continues. Older women, likewise, are to be reverent in behavior, not slanderers or slaves to much wine. So not just to be part of a group of friends and get together and drink some wine and chat about this and that, but to be women who are revered, women who are looked up to, older women who are role models, who are examples that the younger women are like, I would love to sit with that woman and just hear some of her story. I know that she has so much wisdom and so much to offer. But they're not just to be that way. They are to teach what is good. They're to be passers on of that wisdom. And so to train the young women to love their husbands and their children. It's hard to love us husbands. So women that have lots of experience on how to do that can be helpful to wives as they're figuring out this challenge. How do you love the men in your lives? Because those older women have had times where they've been ready to wring the neck of the man that they're married to. But if they are still married, they figured out how to do it without getting caught. I don't know what to say right there. Or how to make up for it after they did. I don't know. But they're still together. So there's something to be learned because sometimes people don't know how to get through it. And then they don't make it through it. And the marriage doesn't make it through it. So if someone's found any pearl of wisdom, you want to mine for that. That diamond, you want to mine for that because it might help you make it in a way that you might not on your own. So there's this challenge to women who have learned and loved and lived for husbands and children. Also to teach to be self-controlled, which is hard. To be pure, which is hard. To be working at home. Well, I guess workplace now. Wherever you work, work at it with all your heart as unto the Lord. So just workers as opposed to lazy but kind also, the kind of a heart that a mother should have. Submissive to their own husbands means working in unity. The Bible says mutual submission. So I submit to my wife, she submits to me together. We're equals, we're peers, we build each other up. So that the word of God may not be reviled. If you look at a husband and a wife and you see chaos, and you're like, well, isn't Jesus supposed to help with that? It, it just undermines some of these things. But if you see a husband and wife that are fighting for, despite it all, 
You're like, ah, I see. I see what Jesus brings to them that is helping them with the challenge they're through. It's not perfection that we're looking for or an easy life. It's God's help in the midst of it all, and that becomes our testimony. That's grace. I once was lost, but now I'm found, right? It's, that's grace. We don't need to put on any act. We just need to show how Christ matters. All right, so the, the older, the younger, Titus, please urge the younger men to be self-controlled. How hard is it as a young man to be self-controlled? Especially in our society, there's like no limits to what any young guy can do. There used to be limits on where you could get or what you could do based on your age, but now it's like our young men have access to anything and everything, anywhere, to do anything, anything, anywhere, to see or be, there's like almost like no restrictions anymore, and that's really dangerous if we're trying to keep our young men on tracks so that they end up as one of these respectable, dignified, older men that have something to offer. They're just getting attacked and undermined every step of the way. So teach the young man that this is a good thing. Self-control is good. And he says, show yourself in all respects to be a model of good works. And in your teaching, show integrity and dignity and sound speech that cannot be condemned so that an opportunity may be put to shame, having nothing evil to say about us. Goes on to talk about slaves and masters, uh, talks about the grace coming in, and it says, all these things exhort and rebuke with all authority. Older Christians in our church, continue, please, as you are, to do your job. Live for Christ in a way that we can watch you and talk to us about it who are younger than you. Five years younger, two years younger, six months younger, 40 years younger. Set an example for us. Continue. I think it's such a healthy thing in the life of the church right now that the older established Christians are stepping out into new ground ahead of younger Christians and younger people, like paving the way. I think there's every indication that the Holy Spirit will use them to show us what missional life looks like, and I love that. I feel like that's exactly the way God wants it to be. So a group that I love and want to encourage to continue and to take that mantle on. I think about you, uh, Sally, as well, with um, the prayer time. You know, that was a combination of lots of people putting it together, but you had a heart to say, let's come together and figure this out. Older women saying, women in the church, how can we bless? How can we pray? It's the right heart, so don't stop. Just don't stop. Don't hold that one event as like your half a candy bar. And 15 years from now, we're talking about the Sunday afternoon prayer time that was so beautiful as if that was the point. No. Your role to follow Jesus and then to love and lead others, that's the point. And that needs to happen daily. But like I said, older than younger, let's go to younger in the church now. Um, think about all the children's things that are happening right now in our church because of someone like a Michaela Diamond. Think about the music team itself with a Devin and a Michaela and a Hope. I'm the old guy on the team right now. Actually, Andy, when you're in, you've got me beat, so you've got the, you've got the title for that. But, you know, think of the younger who are leading the way in the church in so many beautiful ways. What church has teens and 20-something stepping out in their faith and saying, I think I'm going to lead this church. And I don't think Michaela's ever said it quite that way because she just feels God putting it on her heart, so she's a follower of God, and it's good. But doesn't that seem strange that someone would come in in their 20s and be like, I see you got a church here. Don't worry. God's got them some things to say to me. I'm going to take you all guys in some great directions. Let's go. Now, if she led with that foot, I don't think she would be here still today. But... That's exactly what God has done. He's used someone younger to inspire the older. Think about the music team here, the music ministry that's growing. Devin, he may seem 45 because he's so mature. He's not. He's not. He's in his 20s. Paving the way and setting an example. Like what Paul said to Timothy, right? Set an example for the believers in life and speech and love. So that by your teaching and by all this, you may perhaps save some of them. We have some young teens and 20s setting an example for us that should inspire us to be like them. Never mind the little kids. That's a whole other category. But just even in that group, 
I had the privilege two weeks ago to go to uh, the Grow youth group night, and I was in the small breakout group up, group up here in the sanctuary that was our, our senior hires, I think it was like eighth grade and up. Sat in a circle with eight or ten of them. And the things that were shared there were things like, I really want to follow God, but it's hard. And I have some questions, and what about this? But I've seen God work, so I know he's there, but I don't know how to do this part of it or think about this part of it. Or teenagers. And one of the teenagers said, you know, the thing that I miss from Serve Home is being able to be together so much. We never see each other anymore. We're so scattered in our lives. I think we need more fellowship because I miss being together. Those are our high schoolers. Newsflash, high schoolers don't talk like that. But high schoolers who have God doing something in their life, who has begun something, they do talk like that. And they are talking like that. And it's inspiring to me. I wasn't talking that way when I was in high school with my friends. I was basically like the only Christian friend in a non-Christian circle. I didn't even have these other Christian friends who I could have that conversation with. But I wasn't even at that place in my faith where I was like, how do I get more fellowship? And how do we get more outreach? I just wasn't there yet. But they are. So think about what God will do with them and be inspired. Think about each of you when you were 17. Is that what you were all doing when you were 17? Yeah. Definitely, especially Ray. It's a beautiful thing. I meet other pastors and we talk about our churches or someone will kind of bump into our church doing something. But your church is so young, so many kids. And I just sort of feel like, well, that's what we've got here. It seems normal to me until we realize that that's not what we see in so much of the Christian community. So we need to not only prize and pour into these kids, we need to be inspired by them and recognize that when they're our age, if they're steadfast, they'll be way further along than we are now. And that's the way it should be but they are a beautiful inspiration. All right, turn over to the book of Hebrews. So one more book over, and we're going to go to chapter 10. So there's the older and the younger, kind of a compare and contrast. It's similar, but those two groups right now are just so inspiring to me. I can't wait to see what God's going to teach me and teach us just by watching them thrive. But the two other groups that I really respect and just want to preach to, from Scripture to you and challenge you as well are the battlers, the people who are just fighting for it, who are in the struggle. It's not going easy. It's not going well. But you're still just praying and trying, still seeking. The Bible has a lot of respect for people that persevere, for people that just walk in battle knowing that God will and can do something good, and we just want to see it, so we're just going to keep going. I love your perseverance. I love your example of faith to me, and Scripture loves it as well. So in Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32, I want to remind those of you who are battling it out, battling out with a difficult marriage season, battling out with really difficult financial troubles, battling it out with challenges with friends and with dating, battling it out with real serious doubts about faith, and all these things where we have people in battle mode even today in our church family. Please, hear some scripture that may be an encouragement to you this morning. Hebrews 10, 32, recall, think back, remember, recall the former days when after you were enlightened, I mean, after you were saved, after God kind of like opened your eyes, after you were enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with suffering, sometimes being publicly exposed to reproach and affliction, sometimes being partners with those who were so treated. For you had compassion on those in prison, and you joyfully accepted the plundering of your own property, since you knew that you yourselves had a better possession and an abiding one. Therefore, do not throw away your confidence, which has a great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that when you have done the will of God, you may receive what is promised. For in just a little while, and the coming one will come and will not delay, but my righteous one shall live by faith. 
If he shrinks back, my soul has no pleasure in him. But we are not of those who shrink back. Let me read that again. We are not of those who shrink back and are destroyed. That is not us. But we are of those who have faith and preserve our souls. I see this at work in our fighters right now. And I want to remind you of what it felt like when it was just you and God in one of those miracle moments. We forget about the miracle moments. We forget about the joys when all we see is the fight. But the joy was there. And if you remember it, it wasn't because everything went great in your life at that time, but it was because you were connected to God and it mattered. And he did something in your heart. It was enlightening, <laughs> both eye-opening but also lightening of the load. Enlightening. So hang in there because we're people of faith. And so we don't shrink back. We're not going to be destroyed. We're the ones who stand and will be rewarded. God's got us. So for all those who are like stumbling, hang in there. Lean into your faith. Lean into your community. Lean into your Savior. For all those who are angry, confess it. Get it out. All it's going to do is just make the conflict worse. Head into the conflict with love. Those that are hopeless, the whole point is that it doesn't matter what happens. It could even be death. There's always hope. There's always hope. And if you think back in your own life, you had hope at times. So if you had it then, you can have it again. God's a God of promises. I'm inspired by seeing people who aren't quitting on each other. That's happening right now. People are not quitting. I respect that. I'm inspired to not want to quit. I want to live up to that example. I want us all to live up to that example. I want to live on yesterday's enlightenment. I want it again tomorrow. And I know you do as well. But it's not just those who have been battling for a long time that I respect. It's the people who are in that moment of enlightenment right now. Because in the past six months or two months or year or whatever is the beginning of God doing something great in their lives. I think of our friend Bob. I don't think he's here this morning. Bob is this quiet servant with just the best heart. And he can't explain what God's doing in his life right now. He has like no words to try to describe it. I ask you, like, go up to him. Be like, so Bob, what's God doing in your life? The few times that I've sat and talked with him about that specific question, he just goes on and on and on and on and on about, well, then there was this that happened, and then I prayed, and then that happened. I can't explain that. And then someone called me, and they needed this, and I said, why don't we pray for it? And they prayed over the phone, and that thing happened to that person in exactly that moment. He's like, I don't, I'm getting freaked out here. I don't know what this is all about. And like, that's the word he uses. He's like, I'm freaked out. He's just constantly in a state of freaking out because stuff is happening that shouldn't happen, that can't happen, and he loves it. He's in that moment. He's serving. He is installing windows in the church. You know, he's at serve home meetings. You know, he, he sent me a, uh, a text a couple of weeks back. and was like, have you guys decided um, what week serve home might be if it happens? So I said back, I think... Um, Probably the first week in August next year seems to be a ballpark, but we don't know if it's going to happen yet or not. We're still praying. He's like, okay, good, because they're asking me when I want to put in for vacation time for next year. I said, yes, Bob. Yes. Yes. Inspire me with you planning a year in advance with your work and your vacation schedule so that you can serve the Lord. That's just the way to be. I want to be like that. I want to be like him. He's inspiring me. But you know what? Years down the road, if he's the one fighting the fight, I want to be inspired by how I see him do that as well. He's just in such a special, the baby Christians are in such a special time in their lives. It's so beautiful. Just like when a human baby is physically born, it's just this like wonder. How did this thing come to be? Look, look who it looks like and look how it moves and acts and just, I just want to hold it. And when I hold this baby, like something happens to my heart inside and I can't explain it. It's just beauty and joy. That's a baby Christian's experience. Something came alive, and it's just amazing. And those of us who've been in the faith for longer need to be inspired to remember that first love. Remember that beauty. The smell of a baby's head, right? Just there's a thing. There's things. Yeah, don't listen. <laughs> <laughs> 
four is enough, four is enough, four is enough. Wonder, actually, no, it's not, though, right? Right, Eli? Eli's like, four is enough, three is enough. Actually, one would have been enough, parents, but that's okay. <laughs> ah, yes, yes, the joy of new life. That's what baby Christians are experiencing. And so on this Thanksgiving message, I wanted to say from Scripture to you, that you are each in beautiful places and God is doing things and I see it and I want to encourage you not to take it for granted and I don't want us to stay here. I want us to grow from here. This is like a seed. This is just a beginning of something beautiful that God's doing. Please pursue it. Please learn from one another. Please be inspired and let God take us wherever he's going to take us. Let me pray for you and Michaela, if you'll come forward, we'll close with a song. Dear Jesus, would you please send your spirit in ever more and more powerful ways. Those of us who have had a taste, we want more. We're hungry. We're greedy. (laughs) We're begging you for more and more of your spirit poured out, more and more of your wisdom, more and more of your love for the people around us, more and more love for ourselves, even though we don't deserve it, and more and more love for the people in our lives, even though they don't deserve it. Let our love be based in grace not merit. Please, Holy Spirit, work your way into all the cracks and crevices of our hearts. Enlighten us again and more and deeper and further. I thank you for the older Christians in this congregation, this body of Christ. Would you give them tenfold of wisdom, of vision, of experience, and of joy? And would you give them a heart for all of us younger than them to mentor us, to teach us, to show us? I pray for our youth in this church. I pray for protection, the things that they can't know yet, but later on they'll wish they knew. Could you somehow open their eyes, enlighten them to see the things that are beyond them, to help them avoid some of the things that want to derail them? Pray for my kids. I pray for all of our kids. Pray for our teenagers, our college students. Pray for our 20-somethings. May your will be done in their lives. May your kingdom come through them on earth as it is in heaven. I pray for the battlers, Father, that they wouldn't say enough, and they wouldn't say quit, and they wouldn't say impossible, but that in the battle that they would know that you never leave, you never forsake, that all things are possible through you. That faith is the assurance of things not yet seen. That their very perseverance is a testimony to your power. That you are a God who raises from the dead. Inspire them. Inspire us through them. Not just with happy circumstances and easy lives, but with recognition, you are good and you are there. You're not going anywhere. Promise. I pray for our baby Christians, Father. I pray that you would help them to know more in their first steps of faith than we who think we know so much more in further steps. Help us to return to a simplicity of faith not based on quantity of scripture learned, but percentage of scripture lived out. May they be an example to us. May you protect them. May you help us to mentor and encourage and support them. May you help us to learn from them. And for every other group in this church, for every individual, Father, we pray that you would complete the good work that you have begun in them and in us. We look forward to you doing exactly that. And we pray it in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.